I remember years ago I was sitting in the front seat on the downstairs floor of Shakespeare and Company which is a very famous wonderful bohemian bookshop in Paris and this came in the second period of my life that I lived in Paris the first period of my life I lived in Paris was a couple of years before that when I married my first wife and she was very much of an academic bent drawn to academia she became a, a medical anthropologist and during those two years that I'd been in Los Angeles with her I spent a lot of time with Tara Singh who was a teacher of the Course in Miracles and a student, a very close student and friend of Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti. And as I was sitting there, watching people come in and out, I was the shopkeeper that night and for about a year. I remember having this distinct feeling that everyone walking into and out of the shop and everyone walking on the planet was part of a school and that school had a curriculum and the curriculum was about ending the, the reign of fear in the mind. And it was one of these fin funny things because I realized that you can have a role as a teacher or a writer or a, a, a trash can uh, refuse worker that's removing the trash or a driver or a musician or a homeless person. You can be a grandmother or um, a lunatic in an insane asylum you can be a father a son you can be endless roles endless masks almost endless masks but that was just the surface layer the form layer of the world and I think this was very potent to me because I'd been in the company of someone that was very urgent and urgency in that sense was with total devotion and determination but no fear to make contact with something divine, something transcendent, something sublime. And so those two years in, that, in the presence of that, and obviously something in me was pulled to that kind of presence and urgency. When I was sitting there, and that feeling that I had in that moment, it's never really gone away from me, like the certainty of what it was pointing at. It's been glossed over by my forays into trying to end the suffering of the world through like passion for nuclear physics and advancement of technology and and all of those edifices that I've built, all those totem poles and icons that I've built in my mind to organic farming and holistic management all of those things are wonderful like they're admirable brilliant people good-hearted people behind trying to craft a better world and i lord them i i i, I adore 
the ingenuity and decency in the human being. But all of those journeys that I've tried to make in the direction of being part of technos, where technos is the Greek word for fire and wielding fire and using the fire of our imagination to drive evolution and how fast, how big a profit and how quickly we, we, we move over the surface of the earth to get our needs met. Like, all of the movements I've made in that direction have sort of been hit by the wall of that moment in the bookshop and metaphorically speaking because there's a teaching in Buddhism that you know how do you see your life and the world with death as your advisor and then you have the faith in the Buddha's teachings or whatever it may be that comes along with the advisor, right? It's like, well, all of this sentient existence has a price tag on it and, or the attachment to it does. And one thing I've never been able to slump off is that, you know, where my calling is, is this undoing, right? Our education system is about filling up the gas of being a useful being in the mind and there's in, in the, be, being a useful being in the world of the mind and in the world in general and there's nothing wrong with that but I always had a resonance with uh, the story of David Godman who's one of the you know world's proponents of world's greatest proponents in the modern time of, of, of um, in our time anyway um, of Ramana Maharshi's story and his life and his significance and he was just he was at Oxford studying um, geography and he just thought well we're just stuck in all this analysis we're just like it he was a bright man and I was I was a bright man and I was resonated with his story because I went to Oxford and had this interview and would not in probably if I'd chosen, chosen other subjects I would have had an easier path there but I chose like the world's leading evolutionary biologist and but he and I came to the same wall in our minds you know at different stages in our lives and one of the things I'm convinced of is that you know a lot of what I'm talking about just doesn't make sense to most people because the ears to hear have to be there like some 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 awakening of spiritual charisma in you has to happen you know to start to think well God didn't create this universe. I mean, if there was a creator of this universe, you'd have to be a, some pretty sick character. And I always think, you know, that line, and the, God created us in his image. Well, is it the God of the ego that created the universe, which is a pretty sick character that's sadistic and mean and defensive and attacking or is it something wholly good Is that what creators 
in our image? Is that something that we, you know, these creation myths, they say things like that. Well, if everything I take myself to be needs looking at again, if the thought system that's informing it is disturbed by the intrusion of a delusion, then suddenly you see the path of the spiritual practice, which is like purifying the mind. And, you know, I excelled in English and biology and religion. Like we had religious studies in the British schools in my day, and they're sort of being phased out. But I, I, I would, in a heartbeat for children, I would replace them with like, Joseph Campbell's approach to comparative mythology. I think children need that. In a way, I think it's one of the most important subjects for a healthy psyche, because it leads you to a contemplative life. It leads you to the myths that are luminous in our psycho-spiritual quest for meaning. It leads us to looking at stories to find out the characters and the archetypes and what they're revealing about how we see the world. It gives us a rich relationship with theater and the arts and it gives us a relationship with the man of science with his compass and his measuring tape who's trying to make sense of the manifest world and it gives a context for all those things but I find that it is the nature of serendipity is the nature of the destiny of each un in individual human to find you know joseph campbell said the comparative mythologist he said where you stumble there lies your treasure and we do stumble because like it says in the Matrix music, movies, you know, Morpheus says to Neo, like there's something in your mind that will not sit straight here, you know, like it will not, you know something's off, right? And our education system, although we teach history and journalism and English and stuff, and we have all these characters who are certainly out of their minds and we look at them like Stalin or Pol Pot or whatever, and we, we're trying to learn try to learn from the lessons of history but this all-encompassing call of love to look at the pain body and what creates it to look at the conditioning and the programming of the mind and how it it runs our thinking I personally didn't find anything of that depth and simplicity and beauty in my education. I think some schools might touch on it, some teachers might touch on it, but they'd have to be people that have, on a certain degree, in inverted commas, become frustrated with groupthink. And one of my big problems with education as I experienced it was I thought I remember there was a teacher of chemistry in one of my schools and yeah as I was growing up and he had gone from school to uh, university to working for a couple of years in a chemistry lab to teaching in a school and I thought there's this big vast world out there and I want to see it and I'm sure I'll find things that he's missed out on, not to put him down. He did, he lived a good life. And he was a perfectly decent man. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about how 
as with Morpheus and Neo, there was this sense something was off, you know, and you know, you have these secrets, like, and I find it's funny because I heard Jordan Portis Peterson talking the other day, and he said of Joe Rogan, you know, well, he's a seeker, you know, and it was a compliment. It was like, you know, he's a guy that looks for things and meaning, but he's not an intellectual. And all these labels, I understand what he meant. I'm not judging what he said. You know, he was speaking like he hadn't become an intellectual in the in the university. And, you know, he had an, he, but Joe Rogan was an inquisitive mind. But how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go? As Morpheus said, you know, it depends on what's informing the depths of your questions. And I definitely was not satisfied with the answers to fundamental questions that I was finding in in the world of, of, of academia. I often found that literature touched on it, you know, and that's why I was so attracted to Joseph Campbell because he, he was looking at what is talking behind the great stories, you know. And similarly to Einstein, who was drawn to Spinoza and he said, you know, if you want your children to be smart, read them stories. If you want them to be really smart, read them a lot of stories. And, you know, I, a couple of years ago, I read the books He, She, and We, which are about um, the masculine, the feminine, and the, the romantic union. And it was shocking to me because I was on this university degree in Britain recently, and you know, we have 42% divorce rate in Britain, 51% in California, 52 in in New York, 1% in India. And so there's a big difference between the Western Romantic culture and the Indian culture, right? And so the, 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 the lecturers on the course didn't didn't get the nuance of the genius of Robert A. Johnson, right? Who's who's looking at the, how the Western culture's myths have created the romantic love story, right? Most people in India to this day, they get married with an astrologer and their parents overseeing and the families having a, an agreement that this is the right path for, for their children. And there's a lot of reverence for the parents. And we don't have that culture in the West the way the Easterners do. It's different in China, but this, this was profound because you know, like Johnson, I'd spent a lot of time in India. And I, so I could see these myths, you know, he wrote these books about Aphrodite and Psyche to look at the power, the powers of mind and the needs of mind and the biological story and the psycho-spiritual story of a woman and the feminine and the yin, not just a woman, but the feminine aspect of the masculine it spoke to the transgender's needs as well. So it was all inclusive. And then he was about Possival and the questing knight and his wife and their journey together and the dance of that in the context of the androgyny inside all of us. Again, again about the masculine, not just about men. And then we was about Isolde and Tristan, Tristan and Isolde, and then Isolde of the Fair Hands, so this queen, like, romantic vision of Queen Isolde and the magic potion that they drink as they cross from Ireland to Cornwall, and this power that's taken over them, the honeymoon, the all intoxicating devotion to this other, and the, the, the pain of that, the separation from the other, and then the journey through the honeymoon to Isolde of the Fair Hands, which is the practical woman, not the goddess that he adores, but, you know, the woman that prepares breakfast for the children or the man that does that and the roles of the everyday 
path that we take with each other, which is not about this romantic high, which can fall like your Icarus from the skies, but this 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 dance of the the masculine and the feminine energies in all of us. But the course I was on, it was so wrapped up in its sort of provincial view of the mind, which is like we're better than the West, you know, we're more evolved than the Eastern culture, and they, they that, that was clear to me that you know, and it was like, well, if you're going to do psychotherapy. And the fundamental unit that brings all life into the planet is the married androgyny, the couple, the sperm and the egg that come together. And we have such high divorce rates, then these mythic symbols matter. And I found the teaching was very dry and it was very threatened by looking at the wounds inside the therapist that they had, that were teaching the course, that they had with their opposite. In the partner, sometimes it was a lesbian, sometimes it was a straight partner, whatever, but it was like, it was so, like if half the population that gets married is ending in divorce, if we've got this epidemic of polyamory and, you know, um, wounded souls lost in their gender wars then that's a big statistic that you can't ignore but of course this woke culture that's come along that and i don't mean it in the positive sense of the word i mean the derogatory sense where people are looking for scapegoats using the woke ideology as a vehicle for attacking and defending and undermining anyone just in the same way as you know its argument with the and with the patriarchy and there's always this pendulum swing where the power center moves and then the people in power abuse their power right so rather than having the self-awareness to look at this stuff they supported full charge full arms ahead and that's where i saw that a lot of the 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 culture of the world is so embedded in the ego thought system and in a way like Emerson said you have to go away from the world to find the independent mind that is not trapped by groupthink or you know movement like when I look at a lot of postmodernism I just think god these guys are completely crazy and we're paying them huge amounts of money and you look at like Le Monde uh, in, in France, you know, the newspaper and um, to be on the front cover of Le Monde and um, it, it's like there's this sort of whole French culture of academics that want to be lauded for their inventions, right? And in the realm of philosophy and the social sciences, great breakthroughs like an Einstein they don't happen very often and yet this celebrity culture in the French culture around intellectuals which is really a very French thing um, people will spout utter nonsense and it's cleverly put with PhDs behind it and so you know this ivory tower of the culture of the French that puts people at the top um, based on their brain quotient behind a PhD mask um, can be very persuasive and yet they can be just talking utter nonsense and I think there's a sort of there's a very crazy contingent of our liberal politics that is that has just taken over a lot of young women's minds at this moment and a lot of um, gay and lesbian people that they are the persecuted that the patriarchy is toxic and still there's some kind of big conspiracy theory that you know there's this amorphous evil movement called the patriarchy that's out to attack and undermine
And that's no different from the movement back in time where women were vilified and there were witch hunts, you know, or the Inquisition where if you question the church's laws. And so these dogmas just it's part of the ripples of the story of the ego you know it wants a scapegoat it wants its attack thoughts to justify the cosmology that keeps it king or queen over the domain of of the prison it's policing and you know i I was totally vilified for those experiences and it's been a trial by fire because I, I'm sure there are very enlightened people in academia but I also see how much fear comes with a mind like that you know it's constantly looking over its shoulders and needing to back up with endless bibliographies and test runs and and that that is an aspect of the scientific method but i can see how you know creative writers and creative thinkers who have some deep spiritual charisma around them don't want to get trapped by those pitfalls and like the the mafia the cabals that come with these woke academics you know and when you read someone like Robert A. Johnson his books he she and we you know you just you just think well in the western culture if we were teaching those to 16 to 18 year olds who grew up with families that probably have a lot of bitterness and arguments between the parents or dysfunction in general. Then we would be at least equipping our younger generation with some of the timeless wisdom of the myths that help carry them through a life and help them look with less judgment for their parents and grandparents and you know siblings and all the challenges that come with interpersonal relationships. because those stories really speak to us about the challenges we're going to face later in life when we get ensnared in a relationship and we I so I really see that's that's one of the foci of this channel is to you know bring up these brilliant teachings that help reduce suffering and that they are storied worlds that you can bring to marriage you can bring to a divorce you can bring to having death as an advisor at your side and we in the west have this great morbid morbid fear of death and it's interesting because if you study the Tibetan culture, you know, their whole mythological end game is to recognize that death is the most important day of your life. And even that can be a twisted view. I mean, they celebrate it, which is kind of beautiful in a certain way, but why I'm so enamored of the Course in Miracles in Ramana is because they're saying, well, the holy instant is about transcending death. It's about transcending what created death, which is attack and defense thoughts. And the holy instant is about rising to the wisdom of the question what dies. And the question what dies of itself isn't wise, but the exploration of a very open mind into the, the realms that question leads us to over the course of a lifetime that that is the seat of wisdom in a way
and you know my teacher he was so in love with silence and stillness and with my last wife you know she was for a period manic bipolar and she had was one of these people that had what I would call like the movement of music in her like she would look at a situation or you know everything from her whole life was relevant related or inspired or connected to a song and there was a gift there I mean it was just like incredible she was wasn't a musician per se but she she was so on fire with music it was a beautiful aspect of her but there were so many highs and lows and we all have that so I'm not talking about her particularly but we all have highs and lows but what the presence of that teacher brought to me was just like like kind of like this this expanding stillness like an ocean that envelopes you and I've really thought a lot about Thomas Merton's statement recently um, the contemplative is the most dangerous man because you can't reduce him to a dogma and you can't reduce him to like some kind of toxic academic argument that's looking to be so clever it can scapegoat others like like the whole woke anti-woke di so dialectic which is so it's it's so petty you know there's gay people let them be gay <laughs> you know why why make it important that they're gay or not gay you know there's transgender people let them be transgender okay there's some things to iron out like do you want a woman that was a man to be in changing rooms with young girls and racing against women that that doesn't seem fair and the vice versa doesn't seem right either so be practical but the ego is always going to find some argument to attack others and to use it as bait to ah, I've got a scapegoat you know I can justify my wrath I can justify my insecurity I can justify undermining those that are driven by their insecurity now, see, insecurity, you know, people have to come in up to that and look in the mirror of it to drop it. And life definitely brings us to those situations. But what I found in the Buddhist monastery, and there were some lovely people there that I visited in, in Northamptonshire in, in Britain recently, and in the and in the university that was there was just so much conformity to fit with the group think and there's emerson saying who are, whosoever should be would be a man would be a nonconformist and if you look at thomas martin's life you know and also there's a, a character i can't remember his name now but he was very successful in the buddhist tibetan buddhist world uh one of the rinpoches he was kind of a, he came, he, he walked over, Soigel Rinpoche, his name was, and he walked out of Tibet after the Chinese attack on Tibet. And, you know, they, they had to get through the Himalaya, which is no easy feat. And he and others on that trek were eating their leather shoes for sustenance. That's how bad it was. And they got out. And then he came to Britain and be promptly became an alcoholic. And I think he did quite a lot of drugs, but he was very charismatic advanced teacher in some ways, in some ways. And he wrote a book, which I don't think he actually wrote. He kind of like put his name on it. 
and it was a bestseller. It was called The Tibetan Book of the Living and Dying. It's a very good book. And he was such a charismatic teacher and there was such a following around him that he kind of brought so much money to the Tibetan community from that book sales that he he was lauded and kind of got away with a lot. He went to California. He drove a, a car into a fish and chip shop in, in Scotland and then and he was drunk and then he ended up in California and was like just you know because he brought so much money in but in a way he he was quite an advanced being and yet he was also like very dysfunctional and a bit of a problem for the for the group think because he brought them so much money you know and Merton was the same you know he wrote this book that was the seven story mountain and things and like the Catholic Church really frowned on him and then there's Richard Raw today, who's like this, you know, Franciscan, he's a contemplative, and he's working within that system. And he's definitely the most, you know, enlightened in his teachings in the Catholic tradition at the moment. You know, he uses the Enneagram and things like that. But people like that somehow get lucky. You know, their charisma, just the, the, the organized group think is very threatened by characters like that. Like, Martin went through a lot of like being reprimanded by his seniors and like what will we do with him he didn't quite fit and what I found is that usually like in the Course in Miracles it says you know if you seek controversy you will find it and the thing is that like the teaching of the Course in Miracles is so controversial to like like the backdrop it emerged from the Judeo-Christian tradition, the idea that God didn't create the universe. I mean, that's just blasphemy. The, the idea that you are on a path to enlightenment and it's already finished and you're just waking up to the illusion of seeing beyond your past thoughts. I mean, those things are radical and they came out of someone that studied under the you know the pathways that started with freud like helen shukman and bill thetford did their phds in, in 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 clinical psychology and psychotherapy which goes back to those you know german swiss roots of the the last century and so it's kind of interesting to see this incredible contemplative tradition that comes up no matter what happens in all of us at some point when we're ready it might not be in this lifetime but at some point the music of the world and the ups and the downs and the celebration of sorrow which we see in so many pop songs and the celebration of elation which we see in so many pop songs you know it goes back to the origin of it in a way and the origin of that pop culture was you know the first great pop symphony if you like was Beethoven's Ninth and it was like that was almost like the beginning of the movement towards pop and rock and roll because it was just like he was such a creative character he came along with this unifying mad destructive genius that was Napoleon and he just brought through this new music but this up and down this elation this she loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the flip side of that is like, like the music of the Smiths and like the dark kind of like girlfriend in a coma, you know, like all of these sort of like, there's always this duality that goes with the creative experience. And then you have this archetype of of the, the quest where Parsifal comes along into the Grail Castle and he realizes this state of the contemplative mind that's always here, like Indian music that you just tune into. And he tunes into it. And when he does, the neutral angels descend from heaven with the Grail because what's neutral It doesn't seem very exciting and important in the throes of youth, you know, when your hormones are driving you. But 
But some people get cold to that contemplative life. And those characters, Merton was right, they're the most dangerous people. They're not seeking controversy. But the ego is seeking controversy. The ego is seeking drama. The ego is seeking scapegoats. The ego is trying to undermine self and others. Bringing in its ideologies and its dogmas and its all as the course in miracles says it's this projection makes perception and it's the genius of this teaching it's like everything that i hate everything that frustrates me everything that defines my negative qualities everything that defines my sense of lack and my pushed out unconscious unseen unrecognized fear and all my seen and recognized fear with its multi million faces moment to moment all of that is swallowed up by the snake of contemplation and digested and out comes the fertilizer of a new life and that fertilizer, that presence that comes with that kind of devouring of the false for the seeing the false for the false, as Krishna already put it. On one level, it's immensely peaceful. And on another level, it's extremely threatening to the status quo that of the mind that is asleep to what's really going on here and I remember I was this hit me the other day because Tara Singh would talk about do you know what is a fact and I was looking at the course in miracles the other day and it, it talked about a fact right and I think that's such a beautiful question because we think a fact is that this table is so big and I'm five foot eight and that dog is this pedigree and those are all facts but from the course in miracles point of view a fact is you're never upset for the reason you think. You're not a body. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. And it was, you know, the, 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 the gems that you get in the company of someone like Tara Singh, or someone that's devoted to that kind of wisdom. I remember sitting with that statement because I just, I spent like the whole of, I think my 21st year or something, just listening to what he had to say on hundreds of tapes over and over again on a boat on the Thames in London. I just listened to him a lot and I listened to Joseph Campbell but I mostly listened to Tara Singh over and over again like it was burned into me seared into me that was my rock musician it was listening to his talks and then I was reading this you know line in the course and it talked about you don't know what a fact is or something like this and I remember like I suddenly thought right so someone of that magnitude of love someone whose heart is open that much and you stumble across them they they leave you gifts littered through your life you know so there i was you know handling all this i'm still handling it still handling the abuse that happened to me at the university and i've i've talked to course in miracles students that say well it wasn't abuse it was you know when you get to a certain level there is no attack thoughts and I understand what they're saying, like, yeah, but they were there. Relatively speaking, I was taken out. I was a contemplative, the most dangerous man you'll ever meet, according to Thomas Merton. It wasn't being sold these dictates of the academic ego that wants to justify it as victimhood in a hundred different avenues. And
life has a way of pushing you back to the thing that's most important. So I couldn't fit into this culture of like believing in the myth of the patriarchy and this evil woke agenda that the noble woke people are fighting off, right? For the to save humanity from itself. Or the anti-woke were doing that, you know. I just couldn't fall for this trap of duality. And so I was a fish out of water because while I wasn't taking sides and I was seeing the mythological significance of Tristan and his old and his old of the fair hands and the high divorce rate and how, you know, half your relationships that birthed you are on the rocks and there's double mortgages and there's lots of bitterness and grievance and pain, then obviously that's a big part of our problems with regard to coming to peace because we've got all these grievances for the people that have screwed us over. We're not bringing forgiveness in the courses, in the Course in Miracles version of forgiveness to the table of the altar of our consciousness, you know. And it was funny because I was in the Christian monastery when I was handling the abuses that happened to me at the university and trying to report them. And, you know, those very provincial lives don't guarantee that the contemplative has seen beyond their prejudices. Oh, of course in miracles is blasphemy. That's what the American monk at the monastery said. I wasn't trying to persuade him otherwise, but I was just like, the ego will always look to justify attack thoughts and to enshrine its holy arguments of what's holy and what isn't, you know? And I remember Ken Wapnick said, there isn't a single thing, like if you go to Mecca or you go to Kailash or you go to uh, where the Sermon on the Mount was and places like this, you go to these places and we attach so much sacred significance to them. And I'm not judging that, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying that what we project, we experience on a great, on a great s set of levels, you know. If we laud the academic world and thinks it can think it makes no mistakes, then we can get trapped in intellectuality. If we laud science and think that's the limits of our experience here, we can get lost in scientific reductionism. But, but Ken Wapnick said, you know, like, the only sacred thing is inside you and how you see what's inside others. That's the only sacred thing because everything else is fleeting. And I, I, I think Martin was right to the status quo of the ego's thought system of this world we appear to live in, this illusion that we're so devoted to. The most dangerous being is the contemplative mind, someone devoted to contemplation. Not because they're threatening in the sense of picking up arms and attacking and defending, the exact opposite of that they're threatening because they don't in my defenselessness my safety lies they're not playing the games of the, the petty ego that's you know looking to attack and undermine people I'm still getting emails from the people that loan me the money to pay for the university and it's a very challenging situation because I have to find a way to prove 
the people that supported abuses of authority in the eyes of some authority that oversees them, i.e. the law, to prove that some judge will justify that their arguments that they didn't break the law and my arguments that they did, that mine usurp and deny the narrative they've supported. So then they have to pay the university, has to pay the, the fees. And I would imagine that you hear this story because I've mentioned it in a few of my videos. You think, my God, you know, he's so attached to that story. I have a friend who was born with a twin. And his father was drunk one night and he pushed his mother down the stairs. And I think it wasn't until he was much older like in his teens or something, he, he found out that there was a twin. And it was like something in him had been devastated something he never understood and then he heard the news of that and it it broke a part of him right and i i don't see why i should pay for something that supported abuse against me in the name of these radical ideologies that are based on fear and not magnanimity so i have to handle that you know there's this there's this awa awakening of like this is integrity not to and i can see how the news of that story that he had to handle at a very vulnerable age must have really been very devastating and challenging to process And the Course in Miracles, it talks about how God doesn't know this universe even exists, but he left us a solution to get out of it. And that's an awakened mind. And the awakened mind goes on a journey with the guidance of what Krishnamurti called intelligence, but the Course in Miracles calls Holy Spirit. And intelligence means to read between the lines of thought when the mind is very quiet you'll know what to do so with the with the university i've constantly like i've written the story publicly because i believe in free speech but then these are public figures that did a job and i'm i've tried to talk about how their authority was abused to support a narrative that was a violation of my human rights and in order to do that I've constantly been up against them complaining against the domain that hosts that site. So it got taken down for the second time today. And then in order to take them to court, it's expensive in time, money, energy and so forth. So they, they've got the upper hand and like the ego loves that. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a way trusting where that university will be brought before a court or and a, and a judge will hold them accountable. And one of the things that my teacher Tara Singh used to say, he asked a question once, he said, What did you learn that you didn't learn from a book or secondhand or from another? And no one had anything to say, like no one had an answer. Obviously he posed the question, so it was coming from something inside himself. 
and he had such a potency about him and such he exuded such love and I meet people that have just you know studied the course for a few years or Buddhism and I often think they're just at the level of beginner's mind but they think they know it all but you can feel their presence something about the presence of a very peaceful person it can be very threatening to the ego but someone that's waiting for that kind of presence is desperate for it to find it in themselves to use that as a mirror to find it that that's different and i think he attracted people who are very much in that state but his answer was i only learned one thing i learned how to lose so the world is full of corruption. This world's full of horrible stories. This world's full of the aftermath of the consequences of attack and defense thoughts. And I have trust in a journey of my inner journey. And often I'm just like clueless about what to do and who to listen to in terms of inside my head. And that's the purification process of coming to like, why should I be trampled on by those abuses of authority and those misrepresentations of what I said in that room in that were used to sponsor this cult of attack thoughts when the course that I was studying was supposed to be based on unconditional positive regard. And I, I tell this story in these videos because it happened on a psychotherapy degree, right? And, you know, when there were problems centuries ago with the psyche, you would go to a priest or a vicar and you'd talk about exorcisms. And, you know, they had even this sense that the devil has taken over you. And then Jung and Freud and people like them came along and Alder, Adler and all these incredible minds. And they said, well, you know, we can make it into a science, this psychotherapy stuff. And then Helen Schuckman came along in the dream of the illusion of time and space. And she took it back to God, but on with without debunking or throwing out the baby in the bathwater, the baby, the, the baby in the bathwater that, that came with this incredible advent of Jung and Freud and sort of married it with a deeper cosmology of the Christian myth than we've ever had before. And then I go into this psychotherapy degree and it's like very much trapped in the gender politics which is just a mask for ego and it's fearful logic. And most of the students in the room were women. And I, I, I tell this story because that crucifixion that I experienced, which is repeated every time there's an attack thought, right? He's not good enough. I hate that politician. He's despicable. I'm justified in attacking the Palestinians, I'm justified in attacking the Russians and the Israelis and the Americans, you know? That's always a crucifixion of a deeper innocence. Now, I'm not saying that people are violent shouldn't be uh, put in places where they can have remedial attention, right? The world's a very complex place. But if you're a student of the Course in Miracles, if you're someone that's wanting to get the peace that passeth understanding that is related to Ramana Maharshi's teachings, you're on the deepest path that psychotherapy can offer. And you might be going much further along the path than a PhD that's trapped in some convoluted ideology that justifies attack thoughts and so i think it's a pretty good story like how do you take an egg and that's crashed on the floor and make an omelet because you know whatever your upset is whether it's the challenge of handling abusive 
administrators that are misusing the system to justify anything but conditional, unconditional loving regard, regard while having on their syllabus, we teach Carl Rogers, which is focused on unconditional positive regard and all the things that he stands for. You know, you have to deal with this incredible hypocrisy. And you'll find that in any authority that abuses its um, mandate to justify its insecurity and its vested interests instead of like owning up to its shortcomings. And there before the grace of God go I, you know, that's, that's, that's a universal challenge. And the only thing that you have ultimately to handle that is your conscience. And I think that's an aspect of wisdom that the Course in Miracles Holy Spirit uses. I remember asking Tara Singh, you know, what is certainty? And he said, that's a serious question by a serious student. And it, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet because I'm not important. It's, I'm not trying to show off. I am trying to show off the question, not because I said it, but because You know, the judge may rule to support the university. They may, may believe the lies that they proffer up. They may, you know, swallow the establishment story, hook, line and sinker. They might deal a blow to those professional egos that abuse their authority and say, you know, what did this guy do wrong? He doesn't seem to be like a rebel rouser that you're making him out as, but the contemplative is the most dangerous man, right? Or whatever your problem in the world is, whatever your grievance or beef or challenge or unsolved problem is, extrapolate that out and then bring in the question, what is certainty? Well, I would say that certainty is living in the knowledge, not in the idea or trying to practice the idea. Because, yeah, you'll do that for a long ass time, probably. I'm not, and don't condemn yourself for those efforts, but living in the knowledge. I'm not a victim of the world I see. And I, I think that's basically this, the ocean that the contemplative is swimming in. Like there's these choppy waters, you know, on the surface and you get blown around by them and your body does anyway and then you you start to go beneath the surface and you develop a different apparatus for breathing and you begin to survive under a different regulation of the physical story and your thought system begins to change and your eyes open to the depths de profundis i'm not a victim of the world i see it's almost like an echo, you know, you have this, this chorus in a great cathedral in your mind and it's like, I'm not a victim of the world I see. I'm not a victim of the world I see. And this is a truth, this is a certainty. And at the level of form, you're dealing with so many things that the ego could justify using your senses that you're a victim of this situation or that situation. And you may even perish by a roadside or you may be hit by a truck and you're very much a victim of the world you see in terms of the stories telling from a newspaper article or whatever. But certainty really is beneath the choppy waters of the story of the world through the ego's interpretation. It's just seeing the light in others. Even the most pained and victimized and victim identified individuals. 
And how do you do that? Well, you start with seeing yourself differently. And I, I definitely think that that experience in the university was like, I don't know how I'll handle the money side of it. I don't know how the system will handle that. I'm, I've been very vocal and clear, like I'm not paying for something that was a, an atrocious education. But the thing is, the way the system works is you have to take that to court and you have to fight it. You, know, you can't just say, well, you know, look at the, well, I did. I you write to the bodies that are supposed to investigate this stuff. And of course the university is like, it doesn't care about me. It doesn't even really care about the students. It just cares about the bottom line of the money. It will say otherwise, but like it's, that's the whole thing about corporate structures, right? And that was what the, the East India Company sort of revolutionized as far as I understand it. It was the first kind of, company that said well you know we can't be responsible for the people that work in our company so don't blame us for it let the company be liberated from the, the troublemakers so like even if the people that abuse their authority at that university were found accountable the university would go on and, th and that that's in a way gracious because it allows for forgiveness to happen um in in the in the sort of worldly sense of forgiveness like things to keep continue to function because people make mistakes but that's all at the level of effect right and the contemplative is interested in living a life where the inner story is devoted So the echoes that come from the realization of the knowing that I'm not the victim of the world I see. Like I had two experiences today of rejection. First, uh, embracing me in a story of interest, two communications that I had today. And I, I and then I had a third one with where the, the university or someone associated with them had complained about the story that I'd put up online about what happened. And I, I was watching the mind, right? And you often we feel it here, right? There's this glut and it's just like the ego brings in its props and the prop of the glut and the, 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 the pain in the stomach. And you're just like, you know, <laughs> that's why the masks of like, mythology is so valuable because it's like this kind of Ur! and there was a young woman that had talked to me about some collaboration on the animation that I'm doing and then she just went 180 degrees and like and I was like okay that's pretty schizophrenic she was going on about how she was enlightened and she could enlighten me on the course in miracles and I was like never met an enlightened being that said they were enlightened i've only met a couple so she kind of carried herself out of the story and but but I, I you know i felt the pangs of rejection because there was a sort of bonhomie between us and then i found the attack arrows of the the system making me out as a troublemaker when i was just pointing out what happened with regard to the article I wrote online. So I've got to find a way to get that back up and to get around the senses, which have been, you know, they like fear always senses. And then there was another person that came in and said, oh yeah, you haven't been vaccinated, so you can't visit me. And she'd invited me to stay in a place that I was exploring some adventures for the future of my life in. And I talked to a friend about, you know, this uncompromising, powerful statement. I'm not a victim of the world I see.
and you know my my teacher had said i told this another story it's like you know you don't ask for your fingernails to grow you don't ask for your heart to beat but there are other forces in life that lead you out of the identification with the ego thought system and i'd met a, a friend once in my journey in life and she said to her mother when she was 14 i've never experienced anger And the contemplative is the most dangerous person you'll ever meet. Both the contemplative in yourself and the contemplative in the world that you meet. Because the contemplative in yourself is really just sitting at the altar of this statement, I'm not the victim of the world I see. And on the other side of that altar is certainty lurks here, you know. And every time there's an upset that comes into your life, so, I'm now I've just I've told stories from my life, not because they're important, but because for every little story I tell you, which is an abstraction, like you don't have a relationship with this abuse that happened to you at Edge Hill University, you don't have your, but you have a million versions of that story every day in the unfolding of your life. There's always, you know, a little boy picked on your little boy at school and you feel hurt or um, some girl shamed you in the workplace or some woman shamed you or someone didn't send you a Christmas present or someone said something harsh on social media. There's endless injustices. And the judicial system is not always fair and not always easy to work with or possible to work with or you might live in a country where it's run by a dictator and then your senses are constantly reporting that you are a victim of the world you see And that contemplative in you that is like, there's a different way to see this. And then you, you, you come to see that the monastic life has nothing to do with the monastery. It's everything to do with how you inhabit the amphitheater you're sitting in, in your mind. 